a good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jan Reichert, Executive Director of the Antibody Society. Today's webinar is one in a series designed to inform and educate our members, as well as the broader scientific community, about topics relating to the adaptive immune receptor repertoire. The Antibody Society is pleased to include a group that works actively in this area. They comprise the Adaptive Immune Receptor Repertoire Community, also called the AIR Community. Our speakers today, Professor Charlotte Dean and Drs. Matthew Raybould and Fergus Boyles, are affiliated with the Oxford Protein Informatics Group at Oxford University, and they are also active members of the AIR Community. Today, they will tell us how structure prediction can enhance antibody repertoire sequence analysis. Please note the webinar is being recorded. The slides for today's webinar can be downloaded from the materials tab in the box in the viewer and those questions will be answered by the speakers. Without further ado, I'll now turn the show over to Professor Dean. Hello everyone. Um, it's really, really nice to have an opportunity to talk to you all about what we do just a little bit about what the has done in tools for antibody structure prediction but also function prediction and other areas around this and i feel like i'm going to talk about something that i have been saying out loud for a very very long time but is only just coming to fruition which is this idea that it's actually quite important to know the structures of the antibodies we're working with and it's so much easier to get the sequence information that so much of the world has concentrated on the sequence information for a really long time for really good reasons. Yet, further, if we think about structure, and to put that into a sort of very basic context, if we think about the world in terms of function, acts that way things happen. We need things that create a particular function. Two things are the same as far as your body's concerned if they can carry out the same function. If we look at the DNA level and we're all really, really comfortable with this, the DNA level often sequences are very, very different from one another. Actually, they need the same, they might use the same protein sequence. And we can go on from that. If we look at a protein sequence, we can have things that only share very low sequence identities that have the same structure. And that follows on through to function. And so structure is much, much more closely related to function than the sequence information. But unfortunately, there's a big issue there. One of the reasons why we spend a lot of time thinking about sequence space rather than structural space. And that is, it's really expensive to get a protein structure. So I would love it if every time I was thinking about a particular antibody or a TCR or a nanobody or in fact any protein, if someone would just solve the structure of it for me. Unfortunately, the cost of that, even if we're operating at really good levels, is probably in the hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that we're now able to sequence repertoires of antibodies and routinely get thousands and thousands of sequences of antibodies for any question we might be interested in. Unfortunately, not people happily doing their just the structures for me. But that sequence thing has changed completely. I love the right partly because I'm a bit of a computer geek as well. So the white line on that shows the speed of Moore's law. So those of you who care about computers, that is showing the doubling rate we expect for process speed on computers. And everyone thinks this is an awesome thing. And it is, it's incredible. But just to give it a comparison, the green line going down is the speed at which the cost of human genome has come down. So our ability to collect sequence information is phenomenal now. So we can easily get these very, very large set of sequences we cannot very easily tell what the shapes or structures of those sequences are. To put that into a very basic antibody context, and I'm going to use my own group here, we have a database of all of the publicly available antibody structures, SABDAB, and the data the graph on the left hand side here shows the structures that are currently in SABDAB. There's about 6,000 structures in SABDAB, that is, all of the currently available, publicly available antibody and antibody structures. Now, that's quite a lot, but then we have also been trying to collect all of the available sequence data for antibodies that's out there. We haven't got all of this, and the public structures, I'm pretty clear we've got them all, but in the public sequence data, we haven't got them all. But what we have already managed to collect, we have about 
three and a half billion non-unique, so redundant sequences of antibodies, and about one and a half billion unique sequences in a space yes, of dead antibody space. That gap is huge. There is no way that I understand the structural space if I can only look at the cell structures. But of course, work came in terms of whether we actually needed to solve the structures, you know, experimentally with the work that was done by deep release of AlphaFold2. I am dead certain that everybody on the webinar will have heard of AlphaFold2. DeepMind did a very, very good job of making sure we all heard about it. And it's an amazing piece of technology. And allows the prediction and the relatively accurate prediction of most protein structures. And of course, I could close this gap. There are two quite big buts here taking AlphaFold into the region of thinking about things like antibodies. The first one is actually how long it takes to make a prediction. So AlphaFold or AlphaFold Multima, you're talking 20 to 30 minutes on a kind of standard machine to make a single prediction. That's a pretty good computer. That's about might be a bit faster but that kind of scale so given that scale i can't predict the sequence a billion would be out of the computer anybody and even a million is something we won't do we might do a thousand but we're not going to get to the scale of the sequence data we have That's our first problem whatever we're going to use to close this gap is going to need to go much faster and then the second problem is actually that alpha find the general prediction problem of you who work in this kind of immune area are aware that immune proteins, antibodies in particular, don't behave in the same way as other proteins. So the sequence alignments and the mechanisms used to build AlphaFold don't necessarily work that well when you transfer them across to the specialist types of things we'll talk about here. So our group, like many others, set about making prediction tools for antibodies, just to give you a, an idea of how well it works. So I'm only showing you here in that little table on the left, the RMSD, so that's how accurately we predict the structure of the CDR83, so the third loop on the heavy chain of the variable region of the antibody. And the reason for only showing you that bit is basically everything has worked. So the rest of the numbers are not that informative. And if it was perfect, that value would be zero. It's anything around about one to 1.5, everyone will be very happy. So the first thing you can see is actually the numbers are not good enough yet. So this isn't perfect structure prediction we're talking about. We're getting reasonably good structures, but they're still not perfect. But the next thing you should see is our method is the one called AbLooper at the bottom, is that we are able to make these predictions a fold, but so useful, but not perfect. But the other parts that make this potentially very useful want to use it for ability to be able to predict how, when we've made a good prediction and when we've made a bad prediction. So if you look at the picture on the right hand side, the y axis of that graph is how good a prediction we have made and the x axis is showing you it's the RMSD between us to prediction. So if we use it as a cut make a cut off to say when we have good predictions. So for example, if I only take things which have kind of an average MSD between their predictions of just two angstroms, I can ensure that I will make only good predictions and I'll be able to actually give you those. And why does that matter? Because if I was going to make a million models and feed them onto the next stages of something, if a hundred thousand of them noise, you could say, well, that doesn't matter because nearly all of them are good. But why would I put that noise in? I don't need to, because if every other model is excellent, I can take 900,000 good data points through it, only those, and have nothing to confuse my further steps through the process. Now, of course, that does mean there might be some very important antibodies, but at least we know we can't model them instead of trying to base conclusions on poor models. The second thing that's important is how fast we can. So I've already shown you that we can make predictions about as well as everybody else within this realm, but the most useful thing is that we can produce the backbone confirmation around antibodies in under five seconds. That kind of changes the game. That now means if I say I want to make a million antibodies, I can actually go and model those kinds of numbers so I can start to see what's possible. 
but I can also only use for everything I want to do next the accurate models, the ones that will be, if you like, useful for the next sets of predictions I want to make with them. Hopefully, I've vaguely you that it is now possible to kind of put the structural information onto these kinds of tools. And so, what we want to do now is I'm going to let Matt and Fergus take you through the use of that kind of structure prediction painted onto sequence data to show you the kinds of functional inferences you can make, the kinds of things that you can learn and understand and be able to do that. So it's over to them now. Great, that's a relatively smooth by our standards. <laughs> Very much. No, that's, that's really the theme for uh, the topics we're going to discuss today. So um, I, we hope in this section, which is really the main body of the webinar, to recap uh, a little bit about BCR and antibody repertoires, why they're interesting, why we study them, and kind of what's out there in terms of data on these things. This is the traditional ways that these repertoires are analysed at the moment in, in the community, which tends to be a genetics-focused uh, viewpoint, and then to try and allude to some of the areas Charlotte has just introduced there to see how we can paint these structural features onto these sequences to learn different things uh, about the data that within our repertoires and the during uh, kind of pathogen exposure. And at the end, there should be plenty of time uh, for so we do ask us Q and A as we you know, go through, and we'll we'll answer them at the end as best we can. So to take us back to the data here, so what is a repertoire to the antibody society so i don't need to go into what antibodies are and why why we're so interested in them clearly they're uh, immune proteins that can very selectively recognize pathogens and signal that they should be removed from the body but part of their specificity is to ensure that you complement these all pathogens exist in the body the body actually expends an awful amount of energy maintaining a repertoire of chemically diverse antibodies the diversity you read is estimated figures that kind of depend on how uh, how much you uh, factor in selection during development into this. Um, but we can have a diversity roughly of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 18 uh, different BSR receptor antibodies based on just the configuration of how they're made up. It's an insane number. Um, complicated because we have different compartments of antibody repertoires. So we have the sort of antibodies and BCRs that are probing right at the start. With potential pathogens known as the naive repertoire. And then we also have a set of B cells that are uh, preserved as B cells after exposure, sort of uh, represent uh, an immune history of things that were useful in the response. And then we have specialized uh, B cells whose job is to do lots and lots of body. So we, within the BCL repertoire as a general concept, we have lots of individual BCR repertoires that can be distinguished by a lot of cell surface proteins and isotype that come into a little bit uh, can also, also be diagnostic as to which uh, component of this you're looking at. And they differ in physical locations as well. So you can have the BCR repertoire that's floating around peripheral blood, or you can have the BCR repertoire that's localized to a particular microenvironment, such as around a tumor or maybe a particular site, or it's like a mucosal system if it's a respiratory uh, condition. And they are constantly dynamic. So these are these cells that are new made this repertoire is a static uh, pre-coded set of antibodies that you uh, you get at birth and that's all you've got no they're continually running over so they are responsive to the immune state that you're in and we often see signals where they converge towards particular functions so like uh, specificity towards anti that are part of response and this is a really interesting study from the disease uh, understanding perspective and really we want to be able to see a set of people what are the anti the BCR moving in these people at any one time. Does it look like this is a typical sort of healthy baseline uh, uh, response repertoire? Does it look like this is a repertoire in the process of a response? And given maybe that it is in the process of response, how are these people responding to the same immune pressure? Are they responding in similar ways? And we can extrapolate these analysis of the functions of the antibodies that are going on in any one individual to study concepts such as uh, epitope. So these are regions of antigen tend to get. Targeted people's repertoires, 
why certain populations might be more susceptible to disease or more uh, resistant to disease as well, well you can kind of turn that on its head. And increasingly, these records are providing templates for uh, drug discovery, uh, given that these are sort of natural uh, reduced, there's a lot of immunogenicity that might come naturally from them. So a lot of uh, pharmaceutical interest as well in the idea of studying these repertoires. And this whole field uh, has been called immunogenetics, which is uh, really starting to grow and mature into its own field as it's the, the computational study of the data on these repertoires. So just to take us back to where the diversity really lies in B cell receptors and antibodies, uh, because there are two main components of an antibody. So the main, well, this constant region down here, this is not really a huge source of diversity in antibodies. In fact, there are a set of eight to 10 isotypes that kind of define different signaling abilities of the antibodies down here, um, where most of the variation uh, exists in the antigen recognition event happens are on these tips of these Ys. In your naive B cell receptor repertoire, so your, your receptors that are just probing for any particular response, we have three main diversification mechanisms. Region is not encoded on a single gene. It's actually encoded across multiple genes, and these genes can recombine in different combinations, which gives us in, in immediately there in terms of the chemistry of the bio side. We then have the events where these genes recombine to one another with additional junctional diversity. So there is length variation in some of the uh, some of the regions, and also sequence variation as well. We have the fact that these binding sites are heavy chain and a lot, chain. and so this pairing and also gives us additional uh, diversity here. So even in the naive repertoire, there's classification mechanisms going on that lead to chemical ten to ten, ten to um, over uh, in terms of the specificities that are going on. And then now has uh, recognized. And it usually migrates to lymph nodes, changes to another type of B cell, and can undergo somatic hypermutation. And there we can get mutations all throughout the sequence in the uh, CDR loops or the, the loop regions that are most proximal to the antigen typically in this event. Uh, and this has an impact on the specificity as well. Overall, a, the reason these things are so diverse is a combination of, of these various different mechanisms. And it is this variable domain, often the FB region, that we hope. To when we're trying to profile what an antibody does. And so the ways we go about doing that, uh, kind of two main area. One is the MIC, this next generation sequencing approach. So this gives us unpaired VDJ sequencing. So we get that sequence heavy chain or the very main, and we get lots of them up to about 10 to the nine. So we can get a very good sample of what one of the chains looks like. And we tend to go for the heavy chain because it's encoded over a VDJ combination region, so there's additional diversity, and often this follows through to uh, a better capturing of the specificity of the antibody. Use single cell approaches. Now the compromise here is we don't get as many of these sequences, so we don't have a as good a sample of the, the repertoire, but what we get is the underlying chain. And so this data, as we see later, we can start to build full uh, ideas of the full and the structures they're in. So this is the raw data we have to work with. We often have lots, very, very deep samples of heavy chains, and we have more of these in different types of immune states and disease state. Uh, increasingly, fidelity representations of the actual antibody binding sites through single cell recognition, uh, sequencing technologies too. And we can do strategies to sample particular parts of the repertoire, such as sorting with facts for uh, certain antigen specificities, or we can sort for, for example, certain diagnostic sequence markers to try and get the, the sequences of a particular BCR component as well. So there's a lot out there for the, these sequences of antibodies, most of it unpaired, but increasingly more paired data. And what's nice is that um, efforts of the air community do uh, sort of consistent for analyses of these repertoires in a more plug and play fashion, where you can you know that if you have a repertoire in the database, it will have certain properties with it then that will be uh, available for future probing analysis. And in particular, in our tool OAS, where we have cleaned and translated all the nucleotides over to amino acids, of the state of we can track repertoires by individuals, disease states, uh, ages, and uh, time points and things. So you get a good sense of what is going on in certain repertoire or disease associations of certain properties of repertoires.
And this is quite noisy because of the example of everything that's going on in the system. So there'll be a whole spread of antibodies that can bind to different things in these databases. But increasingly, another source of raw data uh, that we have access to are labeled antibody data. So I've shown you an example of a database we curate in our lab, which is the coronavirus antibody database. And here we have the mappings between these FB sequences and, and sometimes these FB sequences against particular pathogens that we know they can engage. A lot of this data comes from the right now. And lot of these analysis campaigns that we can increasingly avail of in our analysis. So we've got all the sequencing data that represent what going on in someone's repertoire at any one time. So how do people start to make sense of all of this complexity and, and uh, predict the functions of what's going on? We start with the repertoire data set of interest. So it might be 10 to the eight unpaired heavy sequences, or it might be 10 to the sequences here. And these are nucleotide amino acids. Most of the things I'll talk about today will be amino acids because our group works at that level, it's at the residue level. Um, Frequently, we can get constant straight out of these sequences uh, because the particular primers that we use in the sequencing can co capture enough of the constant domain that we can tell why is it what unit is attached to the, the variable domain. But a lot of the focus is on the variable domain itself uh, and the concept to map uh, again to create some order to map these sequences onto predicted clones. So which uh, sequences do we think in this repertoire are likely to come from similar projectors and uh, to see what sort of structure, if any, exists in the data. So this clonal mapping protocol is going through quite a lot of detail because it's a very common peak in the field. So the first thing to do is to find this hyperdiverse CDRH3 that Charlotte mentioned earlier. So we want to find this region and take its sequence. And then Antibody that's more germline encoded, more genetically encoded. We want to map these back to whichever V and J gene they are most from. Our VH sequence down into a cross assignment. So we have a probable V gene, a probable J gene, and the CDRH3 sequences will sort of define this antibody going forward. The light chain pairings, we don't have to do it just on a single heavy chain. And once we have these uh, representations of the sequence, well, the natural step is to cluster these together, yeah. which is a process known as clonotyping. And here, the idea is to group antibodies with similar ideas. They will likely have similar specificities. So uh, the common set of criteria that are used is to pick the same V gene, the same J gene, the same length CDR. Have a certain threshold of identity uh, between sequences. This is typically eighty percent. And you can start to get these bubbles where we have antibodies uh, clustered. That we think will have similar similar genetics. And this is a really nice study that kind of captures all the typical things that go on in a uh, repertoire analysis campaign uh, by Rachel Bashard Roberts, that was published in Nature uh, a couple of years back now. And here she's analyzed what's six different diseases and look how just the sequences of the antibodies that are that are kind of drop out of these uh, Illumina or uh, 10x machines can tell going on in this response. Panels A to C here, these focus mainly on uh, relating the isotype of the antibody to so the signaling domain uh, to how much of the antibody uh, in healthy uh, individuals come from those sig uh, signaling domains and comparing them and contrasting them across different diseases. You can see certain diseases such as uh, lupus has a high signal in the IgE component of the repertoire. So the IgE is often associated with autoimmunity. So that but there's a lot of common sense. The other diseases that maybe have more viral origins have more of a mucosal IgA response. So again, just from the sequences, we can start to make sense of, of what, what we're seeing in the response. When panels uh, are having performed that clonal mapping, uh, we can start to, to implicate certain V genes as commonly used in response, uh, for example, and in different components on the right-hand side here. So in lupus, for example, we're seeing an enrichment of these four 34 encoded yeah. antibodies that are normally seen healthy. So again, yeah, we're seeing these really cool signals from the genetics of the antibodies that seem to be uh, present against where, how much of that genetic uh, what do you typically expect to see. And then we can uh, do statistics on the repertoires so we can look at how clonally expanded a repertoire is. It looks at, say, the occupancy of the bubble that I showed on the previous slide. And if we have a really big bubble with lots of sequences assigned to that genetic lineage, 
we can typically say, oh, well, this must have been really important in the response and we can go hunt from there for things that bind into antigens of interest. We can also capture clonal diversity. So given how diverse a typical repertoire is in terms of its genetics, uh, does, does this individual's repertoire seem to replicate that? Um, if it does, maybe it's a typical healthy individual. Perhaps if there's biases here, that individual is undergoing a response of the response towards particular antigen specificities, or perhaps there's some autoimmunity or something uh, else going on here we don't typically see. Yeah, so we can relate like, these, uh, these expansions and diversifications to particular diseases and, and start to understand what's going on there. That, approach to map uh, uh, antibodies to their specificities is to use these clonal representations against uh, antibodies with known specificity and it we take a very similar sequence based clustering approach here so we have in, in blue here antibodies with known antigen reactivity for example this uh, c15 antibody comes from the coronavirus antibody database we know it comes from a particular lineage and has a certain crh3 sequence and we know its neutralization profile and where on, on the coronavirus Bind. So what in this study by Gaussner et al, what they did was they picked the clonal clusters that were seen in multiple COVID-19 patients, but no healthy individuals, and these associated clones, and through a similar clustering approach where we look for same V-gene, same J-gene, and a similar CDRH sequence of entity, they can start to pick out all. Oh, I think here, uh, and stereotyped responses in the way people are responding to SARS-CoV-2, and we can make comments on maybe the a clone based on the other antibodies of known specificity that it clustered in with. So these are really, really helpful. And, and our, uh, by mapping the sequences of genetics and clustering, we can start to learn about what's going on in the repertoire, where's the locus of the response, or what are the specificities of the antibodies that are in the response. But it doesn't tell us anything. And there are limitations to what this approach can feasibly tell us. For example, I've picked out three that are made in clones. So the first thing is that you need typically to reach a threshold CDRH3 sequence identity to be assigned as likely to bind to the same target. Now, in uh, antibodies, when you look through databases, is that the most conserved residues are actually the ones that are really the antigen. We call this the parotype. These are the residues that are actually doing the binding event. And there are certain uh, residues in that CDRH3, for example, kind of standing by and not doing it at all. Uh, and no, when you cluster antibodies, maybe when you think about the, the, the residues that are more likely to be proximal to the antigen, these tend to be more than, than, than the residues that are out of them. But there's no, no ac accommodating that within this classical clonal view of looking at antibody sequences. Another thing that clonal type on is that the likely v origin sequences must match for you to have uh, two antibodies that likely bind to the same target in the same way. But you can see there are throughout uh, IMG of technically different gene loci that have very, very high sequence identities and typically have very similar uh, recognition identities. Uh, because you have the same gene, sometimes you can cluster these into different uh, sections of clonal space and actually overstating the functional of two by insisting that these things must match. And another factor is that clonotyping labels by the closest gene can be a very good representation of the sequence looks like it can pretty much be entirely germline encoded. But there are other circumstances where this is a, a gene that's been through lots and lots of rounds of somatic mutation, you now quite sequenced dissimilar from the V-gene. In other words, the V-gene is not a good uh, label necessarily for what this antibody looks like in terms of specificity. These somatic mutations like CDR loops this can be really important for actually defining what the function of this antibody is. And so towards Perhaps that would be an orthogonal way of clustering antibodies together that might not be so genetics focused, that might be more structural biology focused. If we can predict residues in the different antibodies that are most likely to be involved in binding, we can allow tolerance in regions that we know shouldn't matter based upon conservation in should matter for specificity, regardless of the genetic predicted genetic backgrounds of the of the antibodies themselves. It's really the first place where can help it because, because it's very hard to just go from sequence to knowing exactly uh, which residues are involved in binding to really which parts of an antibody tend to involve anti recognition. We need these solved structures of their complexes, and after that, we 
maybe you can predict which of the rings of an antibody they're most likely to be involved in the binding event. And once we've got that, we can cluster just over those residues rather than over the genetic origin. Replace clonotyping, but it gives an orthogonal approach more from a structural biology point of view as to how two antibodies might be similar in terms of their specificities. And as Shala alluded to, we have a growing number of antibody structures in the structural antibody database to learn about this antigen antibody binding event and which residues tend to be involved in it. So 75% of this data actually is useful for us because it captures the antibody in the context of the antigen. And, and this really enables, has enabled lots of groups. Uh, the field leading group at the moment is a team from uh, Cambridge, Arapred and AG, which is a similar method is a little bit more of an attention-based uh, architecture um, to, to take these structures as input and then to output. Actually, I think these are one I like to be involved in binding, these residues in CDR2, these residues in CDR3, for example. And they do this representation of encoding of the residues that are uh, involved in a solved antibody-antigen structure plus some expression that characterizes the chemistry. And then output, uh, change the output label of in the paratope or not in the paratope. So you stick a sequence in, and it's actually these are likely to be in the binding. And you can do this really quite well. So the area under the PR curve is around about 0.7 for this. So this is something we can do really, really well. And based on that, then we built a tool that takes, instead of clustering over the, the predicted genetic to predict over the predicted paratope, so the residues that we think are going to be involved in the binding. Here is that antibody that basically would be brought into the same area of function space by clonotyping, maybe like this pair of antibodies, they have fundamentally different B genes, J genes, and CRH. When you cluster over the predicted paratope, do cluster together because they have the right kind of chemical profile genes that are most likely to be involved in the binding to do the same thing. And, and this is a real example of two antibodies, one in dark gray, one in light gray, that bind to the MERS receptor binding domain that act across the predicted together, but we cluster together in the genetics viewpoint. So this is something that people could get started very, very quickly with, with their feeding into a clone typing procedure is, is standard and feeding into a paratyping procedure is equally standard. Uh, this is available on uh, the OPIC resources page. And all you do is you have a, so like a master file that will see in your repertoire, or you have a, a repertoire data set straight from OAS. Paratyping feeds this into the paratype and it clusters over those to paratype and gives you lots of different cluster assignments. So sometimes these will overlap with your clonotyping uh, experiment, but it bolstering your confidence that yes, things have similar things and they're really similar over the paratype as well. So I really think that these two things will do have a similar reactivity profile. But they, for example, the example that I've shown, they can start telling you different things about the antibodies in your repertoire that can't be learned by just looking at them from a genetic point of view. It's really implicitly learning structures, so how antibodies tend to talk to antigens. And now I'll pass over to Fergus, he'll tell you a little bit about how we can be a bit more explicit about this and actually predict some structures of antibodies and can help us cluster in, a, in a, another orthogonal way that's quite useful. Um, so I suppose to sort of follow immediately on from uh, the, the idea Matt is espousing, which, so if, if we look at antibodies that are maybe globally quite sequence dissimilar, you can actually, if, if you sort of zone in on the regions of the antibody you know are actually involved in our or immediately around the regions that are involved in the binding, um, you can actually identify um, often antibodies that are globally sequenced to sequence that actually um, exhibit similar paratopes and are like to bind to similar epitopes in their antigens. Um, and so this is a purely sequence-based idea, but actually before we think about sort of explicitly model the entire antibody structure, which although as Charlotte mentioned, we're now getting quite good at doing quickly, is still computationally expensive. One thing we might think about is if where rather than explicitly modeling my millions of repertoire sequences, can, can I instead, fr from the refer something about uh, the structural that uh, those antibodies or the parts of those antibodies that are involved in binding are? Um, and so 
this, this case sort of, sort of stems from um, the observation that um, when you have antibodies that bind to the same epitope, it's to have very similar structures um, and sort of, of particular interest that the, the, the CDR loops um, that are involved in the binding tend to have uh, very similar structures. Um, and so, and this, this sort of intuitively makes sense. You have sort of two, two molecules that ultimately want to stick together. There needs to be some sort of shape complementarity to allow favorable interactions to occur. So, you know, this, this is a fairly, this is a fairly rational thing to observe. Um, so, follows from this is thinking about how we incorporate uh, structural awareness into the way that we cluster antibodies. Um, and so, the first thing I want to talk about is rather than going and modeling the antibodies, can we just from our sequence repertoire say something just based on those sequences about what the structures of the CDR loops are likely to look like? So can we annotate a sequence with the CDR loops are likely to structurally look like this? Um, and based off of that, can, can we say something about sort of the structural dynamics within that, within that repertoire? Um, so both in terms of what is it likely to bind to, but also, you know, how much diversity is there in there? Can we, can we infer any information about the source of that repertoire? You know, was it from a naive repertoire? Was it from an experienced repertoire? Something like this. Um, so from there, we're going to move on to talking about how we can actually model the entire 3D structure um, of the antibody and sort of use this sort of in de novo predicting this specific antibody is likely to bind to this specific antigen. Okay, so, um, so, so the idea of sort of structurally annotating our repertoires, um, the, the, way, the way we went about this process is thinking about actually what we're really interested in is um, what are the structures of the CDR loops like, likely to look like. Uh, so the approach we took, we took the approach of in two tools that we developed, one called Scallop, one called Freed. And we said, so in Scallop, what we said was the CDR loops, um, apart from CDR dots, are uh, one small set of backbone structures for the for the residues, uh, known as canonical forms. And, forms. Um, and, and these loops collectively are sometimes referred to as canonical loops. Um, and so the idea behind Scallop was to say, well, if we can, we have all of the structural data that we can learn from. So if we take the structures do have and cluster them in some intelligent way um, by by their structure, and then by looking at those clusters, you know, you do those clusters align with kind of forms and based on sort of the sequences that fall into each of those clusters, can we then compare those sequences to the sequences that we find in the repertoire to say this sequence from our repertoire, its, its canonical loops are likely to adopt these canonical forms. Um, and it turns out that in, in fact you, one can do this sort of very very reliably. Um, Thanks in thank part the fact that there's a fairly small number of canonical forms that loops can adopt. And so the way we approach this is for each of these loops, so CDRH1, page two, and then the CDR loops, we map the, the 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 sequence of that loop onto a likely template from a structure. Um, and what's really cool about that, you're not explicitly doing any modeling at this stage, but if you know the anchor residues of, of that canonical loop, um, um you can go is not only this is the likely structure of the loop itself, but this is where it's likely to be based off of. You can, you can annotate your your canonical loops with the canonical forms, and you can also start to constrain further how they're likely to set them as a which is really cool. Now this, this 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 breaks down a little bit when we consider the CDRH three loop. Um, we'll sort of well canonical forms for CDRH3, and this simply arises due to the fact that, as, as sort of has been alluded to previously, um, the H3 loop is, one, it's it, it, it and much more variable in length than the canonical loops. Um, and sort of as a, as a consequence of this, it's incredibly diverse, and it's incredibly, incredibly diverse in sequence, but also if you look in structures, those structures of solved H3 loops tend not to cluster in the same way that the canonical loops do. So we can't just map on three loops on different canonical forms. But we do still have all of this valuable structural information available. So what we can instead do is say, um, can we use sort of more traditional protein structure homology modeling techniques to map our repertoire sequences onto homologue in the structural data and then the templates 
say something about the structure of the CDRH3 loop. Um, and in, again, in, indeed, we can. Um, we, we to do this, what this does is a two step process of one, identifying a likely homologue and therefore template that you have a sort of structure for the sequence. And then when you actually perform to generate a homology model of your sequence. Um, and so this works really well in cases where you have um, homologous templates available. And so what's really cool about this whole approach is even without actually doing any explicit modeling of the structure of your sequences, you can start to very rapidly group your sequences in your repertoire with their structural similarities um, and then therefore likely um, modes of binding. And so Taking all, taking all this information together, we developed um, a tool for a structural annotation of BCR repertoires called Sal Plus. Um, and the basic idea of this um, can we say something useful about the structural features of the entire antibody without modeling it? Um, and so, what we did in Sal Plus is we combined several approaches. We took SCAP, which um, annotates our sequences with, annotates the canonical loops of our sequences with likely, likely canonical forms. Um, it uses three annotate the CDRH3 loop with a likely structural sequence, so something that is homologous to, in the CDRH3 loop. Um, then also, as a final step of this, although the framework region of the antibody is very conserved, um, you do you do have a bit of, a bit of structural variety in, in the framework, and the interesting sort of around the anchor residues of the CDR loops. And so we sort of went one step further and said, well, we can annotate the loops, but we can also actually mine structural data to assign a structural template to the sequence of the framework region of our antibodies. And so, again, to emphasize, without ever doing any structural modeling at all, you're able to rapidly go through and annotate the entirety of a sequence from your repertoire with structure, likely structuration of the entire antibody. Say something about what the full structure of the antibody is likely to look like without ever modeling it. Um, why would we want to take this into a sort of intermediary stage of analysis rather than jumping straight to full uh, stru structural modeling? Although the obvious answer is simpler and faster than full antibody modeling. So you can really scale this up to large repertoire data sets. So in Sal Plus, for example, we annotated at time the contents of the database. So we were talking you know, many, many, many millions of sequences, um, which even with current advances in uh, full structure prediction would cost an enormous amount of compute to do. Um, but one of, the, one of the other really powerful advantages of this technique is the all of these methods can be applied to single sequences. So again, Charlotte, the overall majority in retro data sets is still single sequence, just because that's where you get high throughput. Um, and so you can readily apply this technique to all of them, not just the pair of sequences that you have available. Um, and one of the really cool things about this that I'm going to talk about in detail now is when you can achieve structural annotation of an entire BCR repertoire or indeed multiple entire BCR repertoires, you can then start to, when you sort of look at how things, how they group together across the repertoires, you can start to, you can start to infer things about variations between different species or at different stages along the B cell differentiation axis. Um, so we're going to talk a little in a little more detail about that now. Just to define terminology for um, if if we imagine sampling data from uh, naive BCR repertoires, we might observe looking at the CDR how the CDRH3 actually we might afford us this is sort of a, obviously there will be more examples in reality, but imagine we had um, four distinct CDRH3 structural clusters in the BCR that we're looking at. Um, now, if you assumed that no, none of those structures, none of those observed structures were particularly fit, if you randomly sample an IBCR repertoires, you might assume that they sort of, each of these four clusters makes up around 20 of the structure of, of this that you observe. Um, however, in reality, what you actually observe in my BCL is that some structure will be enormously overrepresented. So just in your naive BCL repertoires, most of the is actually converge on a fairly small number of structures. And so we're, we're going to define those as structural stems. Um, and then you will observe some clusters that appear frequency that you 
random sampling, so we'll define that as random usage. But then there will also be some clusters that are actually incredibly underrepresented. So the, 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 the sequences and the structure are represented in the naive, rep naive repertoire, but they're very uncommon. Um, so with technology out of the way, one of the things that we observed when we applied this subplus annotation to data in the observed antibody space is um, when you just cluster by CDH3 template usage, one of the things that becomes immediately apparent is when you compare repertoires at different stages along the axis of differentiations, you go from naive all the way through to plasma. What you observe is, um, in, so in the naive repertoires, you have massive overrepresentation of a small number. Of, 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 of templates. Um, and as you move sort of along the axis of differentiation, so you gain more disease exposure, the, you get a more mature repertoire, um, the previous underrepresented um, templates, so, so structural forms, um, become far, far more common. And what you previously had as structural it's become far less common. And so th and this, this sort of relates back to this idea of your, your sequences undergo somatic hypermutation sort of along the axis. So as you become more disease exposed as, as it matures, you gain far more diversity um, in, in the in the act than therefore in the structures observed. Um, and intuitively this makes sense, but what's actually really interesting about this is just by just by if you have some repertoire data, just by looking at how the CDRH3 usage cluster is within the repertoires, you can say something about you know where you know how 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 mature was how mature was was that was that is your, is your repertoire. Um, and what's what's quite interesting about this also is we, we sort of observe similar patterns in both human and mouse. Um, so the sort of evolution over time of template usage is actually, actually appears to be conserved sort of across species. Um, but we could go one step further and ask, well, are there other other properties that we can observe that vary along the axis of differentiation and how do they, they vary across different species? So again, we can entire sequence, not just the CDRH3. One of the things we can look at is how do the canonical form usages of the canonical loops uh, vary? In particular, if you look in the naive repertoire, you will have things, you have a very small number of canonical forms in use, and so essentially the canonical with uh, things that are close to germline sequence. Um, and again, as the what we observe just based off of this clustering is as you move along the axis of differentiation, um, the rate, the, the proportion of the sequences in your repertoire forms deviate from those of the continues to increase. Um, and so this is another really, really cool way of just looking at the, the you know, of your data and but something that's also quite interesting here is actually um, this pattern does not across different species. Human, you see this 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 is this incredible um, deviation from germline canonical forms, but in mouse repertoires you don't. Um, and there's there's a lot. This has been this in other studies as well. So it's a, it's a sort of a nice confirmation that what you're observing in this structural annotation and clustering approach actually matches up well. Um, about how repertoires evolve in different species. Um, and something that I sadly don't have a nice figure to show you, but um, work that we've seen recently is actually if you look at repertoires from humanized mice, one of the really cool results is actually um, the canonical in humanized mice repertoires. Um, the patterns that they exhibit are much closer to those that we see in human repertoires than what we see in mouse repertoires. This is sort of a nice confirmation that uh, actually the approach get you very close to sort of the natural behavior um, of human immune response rather than still being dictated by what mouse um, and so this is, this is all sort of a really really you know really really nice sort of in bulk what amount of repertoire data but there are also some sort of immediate practical applications of this as well and there's a really nice study um, in self and cow et al in 2020 so this is fairly during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where they used the sub plus annotation approach to actually infer um, antigen binding. Uh, and what they, what they did is they applied this structural annotation approach to paired sequences from SARS-CoV-2 response repertoires. Um, 
So what's interesting about what they did is the sequences within these repertoires were quite diverse, both within the but they were also exempted fairly low sequence identity to the known SARS-CoV-2 binders at the time, again, sort of in the pandemic. But under the structural annotation approach, they at the heavy chains actually formed a structural and so not only do we observe that they all converge on cellular cluster structures, even though they're they're not sequence identical, um, but actually this structural cluster, the the, the, the loops structure, exploited the known loop template from a PDB structure for a SARS-CoV-1 binder, um, and so. So this sort of information is sort of starting to build confidence in, well, maybe actually there's some merit in some of these sequences, even though they look nothing like the only known SARS-CoV-2 binders. But indeed, um, when this was sort of taken on to actually to actual experimental testing, seven of the 12 antibodies from this cluster were able to neutralize SARS-CoV-2, and they did so by a common epitope. So again, coming back to this idea that you can have very sequence dissimilar sequences in your repertoire, there are on structure and a common function um, via their interactions with the antigen. So I think that's a really, really cool example of this sort of approach for um, rapidly processing enormous amounts of diverse data that actually has some immediate real world applications. Um, so so that, that's all thinking about sort of using structural information implicitly. So up to this point, we haven't actually explicitly modeled the structure of any of our antibodies. We've it's annotated them with Look like. Um, but as Charlotte alluded to earlier, um, the the use of um, full structural it just continue, continue to grow and grow and grow in terms of popularity, in terms of the scale at which we're able to apply it, and in terms of the accuracy with which we're able to model antibodies. And as we increasingly have access to paired FV repertoire data, um, one thing we might start to think about is um, what is the best way to actually go about large scale modeling of uh, complete structures. Um, so as Charlotte, as Charlotte sort of alluded to earlier, um, something such as AlphaFold, who is an incredibly powerful tool for prediction of protein structures in general, is perhaps not the not the best way to approach antibody perspective, but you still want to achieve high throughput. Um, and so the, the, there are several different ways of sort of doing full structure modeling for antibodies. The way we sort of approach this in group our tool a body builder is to start thinking of as sort of again going back to this idea that we can split up the structural annotation of the antibody region canonical loop cdr we can do exactly the same thing when we want to model the antibody so rather than just feeding it into a full structure predictor what we can do is we can take a framework region um mine the structural to identify homologs that we can use as structure templates for the framework region um we can then find some or templates for the canonical loops, which we're very confident that we can do because you don't have very many canonical forms. Um, and then you can look for the CDR3 loop in all the structural data. Um, and if you happen to have a sequence homolog for CDRH3, you can use sort of template based modeling for the CDRH3 loop. Then you can always fall back on, um, on ab initio modeling. Um, so you can use um, tools, standard tools such as modeler for this, or what we have a tool called Links, which at the expense of increased runtime was able to sort of generate more more accurate antibody CRH3 loops. And then once you have all of the all of that in place, then you can think about modeling side chains. Um, and so by approaching it in this in this manner, you can achieve sort of quite good accuracy both the canonical loops and also um, acceptable accuracy in the CDRH3 loops. And the real advantage of this approach is you could mod historically you could model a full structure on in on the order of 20 seconds on a single CPU. So you're, you're getting closer to that sort of high throughput scenario. Um, but just earlier, sort of something that's revolutionized protein structure prediction in general recently is the use of deep learning and in particular uh, the use of equivariant graphing neural network well, for two really. Um, and so we sort of thought, well, okay, this works for general protein structure prediction, but so so can for antibody loop prediction. This is the main part of antibody of antibody structure prediction. Um and so we developed the tool AbLooper which uses any to predict the structure of 
all of the antibody loops, both the canonical loops and the CDRH3, um, starting from just the antibody sequence with the constraint of no Mayanka residues. So as Charlotte sort of mentioned earlier, this method proved to be very, very fruitful. And so it could ra both rapidly and accurately model um, all of the loops. But something that's actually important to note is that um, the most the most accurately modeled is not necessarily the most useful. One, so what's often required is actually when you model the, each CDR loop in isolation, um, you get a very good model of them. You actually put that together with the other loops and the rest of the antibody structure uh, and potentially have it binding with an antigen. You actually need to go and do some further modification in the form of energy minimizer piece all together into an actually useful antibody structure. Again, something that Charlotte mentioned earlier is about this is, and it sort of stems from the fact that you're no longer doing yeah. sort of template-based modeling, is by the very nature of this sort of ab initio approach, you have diversity in the predicted loops. And therefore, what you can do is you can say, well, I have five different models for my, for my loops, and they're all really, really diverse. So I have lower confidence um, in, in, in whether, in the, in whether or not I've actually gotten the model right, because none of my models agree. Like models and will agree, even though it was an issue approach, you can be reasonably confident that you're likely to have converged on, um, a sensible solution. So just to reiterate sort of what Charlotte said earlier, some of the advantages of the Ablooper approach is the, so compared to the way we were modeling antibody loops previously, you can sort of reliably Stuff angstrom accurate canonical loops and to within about two and a half angstroms on CDRH3. Um, and, and again, you, you sort of have this estimate of confidence. So you, you tend to get accurate predictions, but you have a way of saying when you suspect you may not have an accurate prediction. Um, and so the advantages of, of these sort of deep learning approaches is if you have the, the, the hardware available, you can take full advantage of GPU acceleration. Um, and so you can um model uh hundreds of uh backbone confirmations for your loops um and so for example from a 10x one can model less which is a really really cool breakthrough um and so if anyone's interested uh the ablu pro code is um and it will on the website soon um so i'll hand you back over to matt now yeah brilliant so <clears throat> we've sort of seen there how search can be used uh Basically, to predict and cluster based on which residues are most likely to be involved in binding. We've seen how we can uh, apply structural annotation to isolation from one, one another and cluster so their predicted likely structural properties and learn uh, what's going on in the repertoire from that. Are any of these uh, clusters of similar loop structures? And now it focuses, walked us through actually how we could go about building full FV models of our paired sequence data. And so, really, in the next few slides, I'll just show we think they're really cool <laughs> applications of what you can do with uh, with these full 3D models of the FE binding site. And another interesting thing to note is that well, as our way of modeling antibodies uh, because it performs better than a bodybuilder, a lot of the stuff that we've been able to ensure so far has been a more classical build homology modeling approach. And so we're, we're excited to see what even better structural models can do to our interpretation to get better representations of so this first idea is if you have a set of FE data for which you say know what the antigen is or you are highly, highly these antibodies probably bind to similar targets so that you can get this data for example by antigen sorting from a from a, from a repertoire and then sing but with this data one thing that we really want to know is which of these antibodies are likely to bind to the same epitopes um and this is important because if you wanted to for example, design combination therapies, we don't want to include two examples of antibodies that are likely to compete for the same site. We would like to pick antibodies that go for different sites and things like that. Epitopes are better for new in the context of a viral infection. And so not all epitopes are made equally. And we really want to be able to start to make commentary about not just that this body was drawn down into the antigen. We want to know some order within that as to how they're, you know, the similarity antibodies are likely to have in terms of aging. And you can decide if antibodies with similar structures tend to bind with similar binding modes. Uh, we've developed this space tool, which is structural profiling of antibodies. Uh, 
And it's a very simple concept. You just take your antibody sequence data, and here we use the sort of artificial uh, sorting approach by taking the database. So we know all of these antibodies bind to coronavirus antigens. Um, at the time, we had around 2,000 data points. We have closer to 4,500 of these now. But we fed them into the structural modeling, the FV structural modeling process, um, filtered for the set that we think are modeled most accurately, and simply clustered them just on their backbone topology. So no chemistry going on here, literally just saying which antibodies have similar shapes to one another. And what we have to look at the metadata that's associated with the sequences we put into the same uh, structural clusters, the vast, vast majority bound to consistent domains. So we were able to antibodies in, sensible, in a sensible way, given what we know they bind to, just from the FE model, literally nothing else, um, and a quite a high proportion of the antibody data too. And indeed, somewhere they disagreed, maybe on the metadata, could actually be linked back to experimental and threshold. In the alive, say, for example, couldn't quite delimit whether it was an RBD binder, or an NTD binder, and things like that. So um, already getting very high performance by just thinking of the, the shape antibody and grouping things by that FE shape. And here is a sort of visualization of an example of 70 antibodies that we, we modeled. This demonstrates really what you can do when you have a hypothesis of how some antibodies combine. For example, a solved structure of an antibody that's already bound to a coronavirus antigen. Uh, an alignment-based docking approach where you take the, the models of, of the antibodies that have been grouped into a cluster, a structural cluster, and you find those with your the one example structure. And you can see that all the yeah. antibodies within this cluster seem commensurate with a particular epitope, a particular way of approaching uh, the antigen. And this allows you to do epitope profiling um, and to really not just say that these are likely to bind to the same epitope, but which epitope they're likely to bind to. And from the CDR3 yeah. and CDR3 sequence that represented across these antibodies here, we can see it's a huge diversity of sequences all linked to the same epitope. So we can imagine a kind of expanded clonotype where we don't really care had an antibody in this clonotype, two of 10 had one in the second clonotype, and two of 10 had one in the last clonotype. Fundamentally, it's the yeah. antigen and specifically to the same epitope. And so these are the so sorts of uh, signal we're able to draw from the data by considering what we think they look like in the three based on that. Oh, sorry. Uh, just on that last slide, the, the summary there is that we start to um, start to pick, pick out actually that already we thought the response to SARS-CoV-2 was quite public based on that work from Galson et al. Uh, oh. We just literally did the genetic clustering. But when we start to group together genetically dissimilar things that can do the same function, we see it's even more public than we thought by clinotyping. And the amount of uh, pressure on particular parts of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is being borne out now with these variants that crop up in quite predictable ways. Um, and interesting by considering uh, structure rather than being hyper-focused on genetics, is that we can look at similarities between different species. And I'll focus on that really nice example earlier of chemical form usages and deviations across different species and how they have different properties. But actually, think about it, uh, virus is equally foreign to us as it is to mice. And when you start to group these antibodies together by structure and not sequence, we can see epitopes that both humans and mice have a Distinguish the antigen as not self. Um, so you'd never ever be able to cluster the genes of the mice and the humans together to find which genes can do similar things. But if you think about their structures, sort of mapping it into a different part of the space, you can start to make functional inferences of how humans might respond similarly to similar targets. So that was just literally just using the, the, the canonical, well, just li literally using the back prediction of the FE domain. But the sequence of the antibody, so we can use some of this information as well. It's not off limits to us. And this is really the idea behind the obligatory uh, software. I showed you a uh, parasite earlier, which was kind of purely sequence-based and, and learned implicitly from the structures of antibodies, talking to antigens to work we care about. Um, but with a full FV model, you can put those residues I should care about onto an identity structure antibody. And so rich representation of how these residues might talk to one another in terms of interaction groups, not just uh, the consecutive sequence, because frequently that in sequence fold together when you consider their structures. 
And so we have a, rel this relative spatial positioning of the parameter residues can be quite in hours to draw. Uh, again, thinking from a cluster perspective, functional inferences of, of antibodies that um, might have not looked similar, just literally in terms of the similarity of the paratypes, but actually a subset of the way that these, in, these residues are connected in space brings them towards well, actually they might be able to come to the same. And so this was the, the idea behind uh, Abligacy, where we, we represent these antibody binding sites by the, the color of the chemistries of the different residues, but also the spatial positionings. And we uh, represent this via what are known as hash tables. And so we can put up these sort of triangular representations of different antibodies, might, uh, these different residues on the antibody might talk to one another in the context of a binding site. And so we map this, this sort of spatial paratype into and use computer methods of similarity between hash tables to cluster these representations together. And based on a threshold that's been set on solved structures that we know to the same as and kind of the properties of their paratopes and what are the conserved features there, we can set a cutoff, say, if your Tversky similarities, we're going to group these antibodies together as potentially able to bind to the same epitopes. And this is the two really nice examples of, of how this can take you even further uh, beyond what paratype, uh, paratyping can do by considering the structure. Here we have uh, four antibodies, three of which will engage the same antigen and one of which does not engage the same antigen. So it's fundamentally different in terms of its specificity by far. If we just look at these antibodies based on the CDRH3 profile, uh, all of them would be scored as dissimilar. So these are not going to get clustered. The different in that way. If we think instead by ability, we actually are able to surpass the ability of all of the antibodies that engage the same antigen. We must retain the sensitivity of finding the antibody that doesn't engage the same antigen, but that doesn't meet the ability threshold. And so what we what we're showing here to be the, the paratopes of these antibodies underlined in bold uh, here. Sometimes the paratope uh, identity would fall below. Together, I think, together. but because the spatial positioning of certain key residues across the interface is similar enough, we group together the antibodies likely to bind to the same site. So we can take even bigger jumps in uh, genetic space, in paratope space, to, to spot to spot the functional commonalities between antibodies with as well. And this allows us to play around with ideas that we don't even necessarily need the same length of CDRH3 sequence. Uh, so long as maybe that is exactly the same structural positions, we can have antibodies with different CDR lengths that might bind to the same site. And here, antibodies where uh, the same shape for the H3 can adopt two different shapes and bind to the same target. And uh, Abligity was uh, able to sort of see beyond the fact that these antibodies are different H3 loops and see there's enough similarity here that they're likely to bind to the same site, which is really cool. Another application of models is that we can start to look for um, how we how we define the structural diversity of an entire repertoire. We look at uh, so isolation. What we want to see is all the FE shapes that are involved in my repertoire. Um, so this represent this sort of uh, flow chart on the left side shows one way to do this data, where you have to pull together heavy and lighting sequences and consider how they might pair with one another. But increasingly, we have this pairing from 10x data. Kind of, we can we do this easily where we just take the pet sequences, model them, and then we can look at the diversity of these models and compare where these models sit based with different individuals. We can go from sequences to snapshots of the FB structures that are present in someone's repertoire. And as we different individuals to look at how similar the structures that are sampled in their repertoires are to one another, and we, we end up with these ideas of pro more private structures that you see in a subset of the individuals in public structures that are observed in every single individual. And what we see in the genetics world in terms of how similar people's was is that actually most people's repertoires are cloned with pride, right? There's this beautiful study from uh, Brian Briney in Nature where they did really, really deep VHC of individuals and found that just 0.00% clonotypes were shared across 10 individuals, which would imply that yeah, if, if you had to belong to the same clonotype to respond to the same antigen, we shouldn't be responding to the same antigens in the same ways. But actually mapping this onto structural space, given that structure is often also conserved across same uh, antigen binders, we actually see that 
kind of the stretches we was persisting when you keep adding new individuals. So about 3% of these distinct structures we see in everyone. And this is consistent with the sort of overlapping uh, reactivities we see between people's repertoires. And we've proposed this, proposed this as a structural kind of basis set. Um, and we've got ideas that maybe we could use towards um, live design for drug discovery. We've also taken this set as representative of what the antibodies typically look like in humans to learn about maybe enough therapy to antibody and so we're playing around with this idea and what we can learn from these really common three percent of structures looks also ideas that are quite similar to the clonotyping idea so we mapped the common fe structures that are present in three individuals before vaccination and then look at how those commonalities change after vaccination what we see is that the, the proportion of structural similarity in the repertoires goes up after vaccination and this might implicate particular structures in the actual response, uh, for maybe the changing of canonical classes that you don't typically get at baseline, but you do get after antigen response is being seen here. And so this is another to study and, and learn what this can tell us. And then finally, Fergus will, will wrap this presentation up with an idea of um, we can do an antigen in mind, but we don't maybe have a lot of examples of antibodies that uh, actually bind to it. So cluster so much to option. We might have to think about this in a different sense. This is very early stage uh, work, but we're thinking in this area and uh, Fergus will sort of walk us through how we're thinking about it. So this, this, this sort of final idea is, I think it's going to probably sort of the, the, the this part of this presentation, as, as Matt said, it's very, very early stages research. So the idea, and it's, it's sort of limited by, um, in order to start thinking about sort of Analyzing the library to try and identify sort of novel binders for an antigen of interest, and you know, one must first construct um, a reliable antibody, which is a non trivial challenge, um, even in the advent of increasingly available paired data. Um, so, for one, for one further, of I have a library of structures available, let's do something cool with it, is I might say, well, I have a, I have a, rep I have a repertoire associated with the um, topic, topical example obviously being SARS-CoV-2 and sort of related coronaviruses, I might immediately ask the question, does this repertoire contain something useful that we're interested in? So for example, I have a SARS-CoV-1 repertoire, is there anything useful in there for SARS-CoV-2? Um, yeah, we have this library present, we yeah. have the ability to go and model, we can sort of cluster and then model a subset of this library to get sort of some set of representative structures to to the diversity in my in my repertoire um can i can i come up with a way of rapidly screening and i come from a small molecule drug discovery you know with the small molecule world the idea of i have a library of compounds i screen it against a protein target of interest is old hat people have been doing it for a long time with very degrees of success i must admit um but can i come up with a method given all of the structural data and a structure a solved structure idea of my antigen the method of actually screening this library of anti antibody model things that are likely to actually bind to that antigen target um and often this is the option that you really have if you don't have some sort of prior data or examples of antibodies that engage your antigen of interest so there's already sort of been a question about sort of a truly novel target in the chat so you have some repertoire for maybe a related disease but no knowledge of known binders for your new target maybe this is a this is probably the best the best place that you can start um and so the way we approach this is sort of take again taking ideas of what people have done in the drug discovery world where people found that, um with the ability to represent a 3d protein structure in a way that is amenable to being fed into previous evolution of neural now networks um in sort of analogous ways to how they analyze 2d images and 3d videos and so you represent it as a set of images um sort of take each atom or atom type in your structure as sort of a different channel analogous to color channels in images so one image is actually three different sets of pixels one for red one for green one for blue you can do the same thing with protein with protein structures and feed that into a convolutional neural network um had sort of a lot of success in a small molecule will bind to a protein of interest so we thought can we do the same thing with 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 antibody antigen binding so can we train a, a neural network to say based on the structures of antibodies and antigens to say 
this antibody is likely to bind, this antibody is not likely to bind. Um, and one one just here is sufficient to simply have a structure of the antibody and a structure of the antigen, because that you still need a way of saying this is the epitope, this is the epitope, but also this is the 3D confirmation. We think they would bind if they bind. So this is our best guess for how they fit together. Um, and so this whole process necessitates which I'm familiar with it is basically the idea of I have one protein, I have another protein, I rotate and space trying to predict how they will sit together. Um, but given that you're able to to perform that to some degree of success, you can then do these things behind. Uh, and so we did this in our tool DLab. Um, and so just a, a very brief overview of this pipeline, because it's really sort of a multi-stage process. You can't just go from sequence to predict. Mind. Um, we start by saying, okay, let's use a bodybuilder to model the structure of our antibody. And we have a, we have a crystal structure of, of, of our antibody market. Um, and then we use tools such as ZDoc to predict um, a set of docking poses. We use an ensemble of 500 poses, for example, for this is how we think things could fit. This is their 3D complementarity. Um, and then it turned out that it wasn't sufficient to just go from that to immediately predicting the binding, because when you do docking, if you're familiar with it, um, oftentimes you're able to sample the correct binding pose, but it's actually really quite difficult amid all of the incorrect binding poses that you sample to pick out the correct binding pose. So it turned out it was actually first necessary to train one convolutional neural network, DLabRI or DLabRI score, to actually take the list of poses out of your docking tool and fit. This is the one that is actually the best pose, rather than just taking the one that the docking tool thinks is the best pose. Um, and so from that, you can, say, you can reduce the number poses are by thresholding that to some level of confidence or you know, taking the top n percent you were saying earlier about not to feed ways into your model necessarily you can arrive at sort of your best chance for predicting binding and then given this you can then take a set which is trained in a slightly different way for task uh d lab virtual screening or d lab vs to predict all of these things that i think i have a good guess for how they stick Binding or it's just some sort of spurious 3D shape complementarity, but can't form any interesting interactions. Given that the break true binding event. Um, and just to very, very quickly give you, give you an overview for sort of how well this performs. So the figure on the left here um, shows how well you do, uh, how well, so the, the first set of bars shows how well you would expect to do if you randomly sampled from your library of antibodies. Um, so the blue bar shows um the ratio of the, the chances of having a binder in what you've sat two percent i read the red bar shows um the likelihood of getting a true binder if you take the top 20 percent of things in your library so there's obviously when i do actual screening i'm trying to reduce a big library down to a tractable number to test experimentally the percentage the top n percent that you can take is going to be dictated largely how much stuff you can but clearly has an effect on your ability to pick out a binder. And so what we found was when you lab VS and use the doctor predict poses um, on models of your antibody structures without doing the thresholding of sort of removing things that look like bad dot poses, um, you are able to enrich your hit rate for picking out binders a little bit. Um, it gets about you know, maybe twice as good to around twice as good sampling your model line. But it, great so there's a there's an obvious there's obviously this issue of if the dot pose is bad you can't really predict if they bind however when you apply this additional thresholding you know the lab read method to pick out good poses and throw away things where you think it's not such a good pose um you can increase your enrichment rate to um in maybe four five six times um the the likelihood of randomly pulling out a binder from your library depending on how much of that library you can sample on the right, it just shows um, when you look at when, when you have uh, different amounts of different numbers of poses available. Um, when you start thresh when you start thresholding at different levels, you're you're far more likely to. And this is also very intuitive. You're far more likely to actually pull out a pose that is um, quote accurate. Um, so the, the, you're filtering out a lot of noise by having a reliable way of doing this thresholding. Um, and so it's a 
early days, right. but this appears to be a potentially very powerful approach of um, interrogating the, the repertoire data that you have available uh, when you're trying to attack sort of a really novel antigen for which you don't necessarily have any known binders as a starting point. Um, just to wrap up, sort of, a very, a very high level overview of, of lots and lots of different approaches, um, ranging from sort of just exploring things in sequence space right way through to full structural modeling. Um, with sort of advances in availability of paired data, plus the accuracy and speed with which we can reliably um, antibody structures, there's a growing role for different forms of structure-based uh, structure based approach to our analysis. So um, you, you can start with this idea of just annotating structures or predicting paratopes um, through to trying to cluster things in structure space through to actually explicitly directly trying to predict sort of binding dynamics, um, binding events, just purely based off of those structures with no prior knowledge to exploit. Um, so if anybody's interested in experimenting with any of these tools, maybe applying one or all of them to some of your um, data sets or workflow tools, for paratyping, Plus, Scallop, Ablicity, and DLab um, are publicly available on our GitHub page, Oxpig. Um, they're all available. You can go download them, have a play with them. The SABDAB and OAS databases, as well as the derivatives like CovabDAB, TheraSABDAB, are hosted on our website. So you can explore the data in those. All of the SABPRED tools, such as a bodybuilder, are also hosted on our website. So you, you just have a sequence of interest, you want to generate a model for it, you can use our website. Um, but if you would like to get a hold of uh, the SABDAB database and the tools such as a bodybuilder that are dependent upon it, um, we distribute our platform as a virtual machine and as a singularity container called SABBOX, um, which is available through the Oxford University links on the slides. Um, it's com available completely free of charge for academic use. Um, so you just get a hold of the container or the VM, download it, um, unpack it, and go and play with all the tools. Um, there, there is a license fee for industrial users, um, but this is continually updated with any with any new tools, uh, for example, Abloop. So you have continual access to all of these tools. Um, so with that, and with the knowledge running on, so we'd just like to thank um, all of our industrial collaborators, um, all of the members of OPEC who have been involved in the development of many of these methods, uh, as well as some of the current methods me members of OPEC who are continuing to drive forward the development of some of these methods. Um, so this is the entire group here. Um, I was ill, so I'm not there, sadly. Um, so thank you very much for listening. We're aware this in our covering um, but in the time that's remaining, we would be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. We do have a few questions, so let's just get right to it. Is there any threshold regarding CDRH3 length and accuracy to structure? Uh, what, um, to, to some extent, so I suppose it's important to template the best method and our initial methods. Um, obviously, when you're doing template-based modeling, for example, what we would do with Freed, um, you're less constrained by the, your actually is less influenced by the length of the loop itself um, and more by whether, um, how homologous the best template find is. So if if you have an unusually long DR, but that happens to be a really, really good template in the known structural data, uh, chances are you can generate a really, really accurate model even with CDR. Um, however, obviously, in you know the upper the, the, you know a very small percentile of salt structures in terms of length, you're less likely to have a good um, yeah. good template. You will have a bad model, but that's more just a consequence of it being data driven um, rather than the length itself. Geo methods, for example, Abelian is completely length independent. Um, there doesn't appear to be an enormous issue in terms of sort of slightly longer loops being hard. Um, but just in general, a longer loop, it will take longer to model. Um, and depending on the method you use, yes, there may be some issues with accuracy. Um, but uh, it's not quite as simple as um, loops above this length are harder to model in that respect. Okay. 
Next question, is it reasonable to assume that structure of the CDRs is related to the solution it is crystallized in and the structure in, say, PBS would be different? Well, I think in general, uh, the thing we have to remember with all structures is that they're measured in some way, right? And there's often, they're often measured in a way that uh, quite, sorry, is quite um, destructive to the protein that's, that's being assessed. So if we're talking about exocrystallography, we're bombarding it with X. We're talking about uh, uh, AM, yeah. we're freezing yeah. molecules. So we're, we are perturbing the molecule during the structure solving process. And so, yes, it's important to consider uh, thinking about this very rigorously that any way of solving the structure is like, uh, is like to have an influence on the structure we actually see. Um, and to be honest, uh, most of the structures in uh, SABDAB, when they're x ray structures, are. Similar ways, and so we see that in the context of all the noise that's going on here. This this is one bit of noise that can be um, kind of disregarded, but yeah, theoretically it should happen. Next question: Since the HCDR three has too much variability to organize into a set of canonical forms, but still is most important for binding, what kind of information can you get from these canonical forms for other CDRs? And equivalently, may the epitopes be classified into canonical forms or, as for HCDR3, is variability too great? So I think there's a few parts of that question that I kind of need unpacking. And I think this was asked actually before Fergus walked through the canonical form clustering with things like that. So clearly, we can, we can learn a lot from the canonical forms, even though uh, Classically, they they are considered as important for binding site. But the idea that CDRH3 is always more important for binding is an oversimplification. It tends to be, but again, it's not in certain antigen contexts, it isn't the dominant role for binding. And actually, the other CDRs are much more important. You can imagine very short CDRH3s that don't have uh, quite featureless, maybe they're mostly glycine containing, they're not going to play a huge role in the binding. So, that's for yes, it's very important, but the CDRs also are very, very important too. And the, the point about epitope prediction is, is a good one. So we still are very predict an antigen, what is the epitope of an antigen? So we don't really know the features of, of epitopes. So while it feels like there ought to be some kind of classification that we can we can group epitopes together via their canonical structural features, right now we're not at the point where we can do that. Since recent approaches where people have tried things like antibody fragments into antigens and using that as a vector for um, which epitope similarity in terms of Asian antibody, but it's still a very early early days for that field. So I think this is something that people want to quite do. Yeah. Next question. I think this will be a quick one. Perhaps I missed it. Is CDR being defined by IMGT in all of these studies? If yes, CDR L2 is only three residues, which might not capture CDR L2 accurately, perhaps. If not, which definition is universally or accurately recommended for paratope and clonotypic analysis? So, very quick, here's the north definition. And the reason we do that is because that's more of a structural definition of the CDR uh, rather than genetic definition of the CDR. Um, IMGT is really, really useful when you're comparing. Uh, or antibodies to TCRs or antibodies and nanobodies or different classes of immunoglobulin because the equivalent regions have roughly the structural position. But if you want to say stick together an antibody via a modular approach, it's better to use a definition of CDR that captures the uh, the integral element. And so that's why we tend to use the north definition. Uh, and in the north definition, CDR L2 is a pretty good one. Um, there are lots of analyses where I think that and that's where they've talked about the impact of using different CDR definitions on your conclusions. Yes, that absolutely does uh, make a yeah. difference. But as model, we have a principal definition based on uh, the modularity of the structure. So uh, that's that's why we made the decision to go. With. Next question: With the deep learning approach, how would you expect structural prediction to behave for a new or less well-studied target like a novel? vaccine antigen target? Uh, so that's a really good question, but I, I think, and, and this perhaps doesn't go 
approach, but also the, 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 there are similar issues with uh, sort of previous uh, template based approaches or even any other data driven ab initio method. Um, and what you would really expect is um, if the antibodies that are like a novel target to are, are sort of in, incredibly sequenced dissimilar to anything that you have in, in the data, data approach either or a template based or database search method is going to be is if, if not going to then at least is going to have much less data that you learned previously to draw upon um, and so either we'll be able to model it less accurately or competitiveness prediction for example if you think about a blueprint it might be more variable in predictions because it's less constrained by what it's seen previously um, however it's not clear whether that, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily imply that um, it's the novelty of the target that is going to cause you problems in modeling. It may be the case that you have actually a really novel antigen target, um, that there's um, there is some exploitable um, motif in the epitope, which actually, although it's globally similar to anything you've seen previously, it's actually key for the binding, and that one motif is all it takes for the antigen that would neutralize it to have a common structural feature. And with that, with that, you've seen previously, and therefore modeling the important part is easy to do. Um, and so, in that respect, it, you might actually generate a really good model, even if um, hasn't seen antibodies for anything like it before. No, like I've seen in the SAR plus example that you brought up, where we didn't have much data on SAR theory 2, but we had some data on SAR theory 1. And there, the homology of the, even though it was a novel target, the homology of the antigen kind of saved us. Exactly. Um, Okay, we're going to take one more question because I think it's going to be really quick and then I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up. Uh, no worries, though, for people whose questions did not get answered, the speakers will contact you with the answers. And that quick question is, is the structural annotation method species agnostic? Yes. Yeah. You know, you have, you, have a, you have a sequence, you can you can number the sequence, pick out this is the framework region, these are these are the, the sequences for all the all the seed. Um so and, and then being able to do a for example, a database search for sequences or parts of sequences that are homologous to what you have. That's all completely species agnostic. So uh, you can apply it to sort of sequence from any species. Um again, coming back to this idea that all of these methods are data driven structural data we have. Obviously, some species are incredibly overrepresented in the PDV, human and mouse being the obvious ones. So if sequence on mouse sequence, um, your structural annotation method is on average going to yield more better and better potential than if you have a sequence from a very understudied species. But this isn't a this is nothing to do with the annotation method itself. It's purely a consequence of being data driven at the day sort of um, very, very imbalanced. And we've, uh, we've benchmarked this at least on humans and mice who've tried holding all the mouse data and seeing if we can get a better prediction just from human data. And what we found is feeding in all the data helps. We, it doesn't matter if we actually truncate it by the data that we end up in isn't worth it. Uh, so it's better to include both of them. So great question. All right, well, thanks very much. And again, I'm sorry we can't get to the last couple of questions, but um, no worries. Uh, the speakers will contact you with the answers. So in concluding, I'd like to thank our speakers for relating their insights into how structure prediction can enhance antibody repertoire sequence analysis. I thank you for joining the webinar today. An on-demand version will be available in a few days. I'll send a link to it via email to everyone who registered. Please do feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again, and have a great rest of your day. That's all. Thank you.